like to welcome Tom Nixon and Laura Ingalls from Elevate Communications, and that is LV8. Are you going to put that up there for us? It Laura, might Tom? make an appearance, yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Tom. He is the president of Elevate Communications. Uh, their main role is an integrated public relations business. Is that mm -hmm. a correct statement? Okay. He's got uh, 20 years in the industry, and he is very enamored with the whole creative process, so is committed to remaining in this industry. His goal in forming Elevate was to provide a unique experience to small businesses and medium-sized companies. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in English and Communications from U of M, University of Michigan, where he wrote for the university's paper, The Michigan Daily. He also dabbles in music a little bit. Mm -hmm. What is it that you play? Uh, bass guitar and acoustic guitar. Nice. He looks like a guitarist, right? I used to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Laura Ingalls, his account executive. I've had the pleasure of working with Laura for about a year and a half, maybe. Um, and she is also a marketing major. She graduated from Walsh. She's got experience in financial services industry, uh, marketing in that aspect, and also in uh, insurance, right, and be in the insurance industry. So with that, I will turn it over to Tom. So thanks, Jennifer, for the uh, warm introduction and to all of you for coming today. Obviously, what we are going to talk about is actually one of my favorite topics. Um, I have no formal leadership training. I do not have an MBA. Um, I never went to any sort of business management school. However, uh, Jennifer referenced 20 years that I've been in business, and I have, as we're going to talk about today, gone through an evolution that if any of you are in leadership positions someday, you will go through a similar evolution. And what I want to focus on today is there's two sorts of evolution within leadership. There's the facet of leadership that changes as a company evolves. So we're going to track the evolution of a company that starts perhaps at a startup phase, entrepreneur, and evolves into a real life company. So oftentimes right uh, before their very eyes and they're not even noticing it happening. That happened to me. And you evolve into this hustling, bustling enterprise and before too long you look around and you say something either has changed or something needs to change. The second component is how leaders evolve over the course of their careers or their lives. How a leader comes into a leadership position, how they embrace it, and how they succeed or fail. And uh, through the research that I've done, and I have studied on the topic since uh, low many years ago uh, when I was in college, and through my own observations as an entrepreneur who eventually went on to uh, be the president of a 30-person company, I've seen some things, I've uh, studied leadership, and I've experienced it firsthand, the evolution that we're going to talk about today. So I'll tell you a little bit more about my history because it, it is relevant a little bit later. But I wanted to start with a short video clip. Hi, welcome. On leadership, it's actually um, um, a clip. Probably, yeah. It's a clip. Uh, you'll have to bear with me. The audio isn't great. It's a little bit old. But it is from one of my leadership heroes. And I wanted to kind of use that to set the tone. We're going to reference back to it and have some discussion around it in a bit. Some of you may recognize it. If you're old and gray like me, you might recognize this individual. Um, but I'll start with that. Jim is like Big Bird. He is tall and yellow and very nice. But would I put him in charge? No. I don't think so. He Big Bird doesn't make the tough decisions. I, if I was going to put someone in charge, would put Bert in charge, or I would put one of the real grown-ups in charge, like Maria or Gordon, maybe. Come on, Mike. You're, you're interrupting. You're kidding me, God! You say right on the silent but deadly, and then you're expecting not to make party noises with my mouth. What is this? You know what? We're not going to die. We're going to die. Lord of <laughs> yeah. right? And if I had a gun with two bullets and I was in a room with Hitler, Bin Laden, and Toby, I would shoot Toby twice. No. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Really funny. You went too far. We want to go home. Well, you don't even have anybody to go home to, Toby. Hey, Toby. Hey, you know what? I have an idea. Why don't you leave right now? Why don't you walk away from the room? Okay? We're coming from below. We have this 
presses some ceilings. These are silent killers. You are the silent killer. Go back to the annex. Hey, Jim. Not now, Toby, my oh, God. Jesus. Get the hell out of here, idiot. What can I do? Can I just say that of all the idiots, in all the idiot villages, in all the idiot worlds, you stand alone, my friend. <laughs> no, God! No, God, please, no! 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 Why are you the way that you are? Honestly, every time I try to do something fun or exciting, you make it not that way. I hate so much about the things that you choose to be. I tried to talk to Toby and be his friend, but that is like trying to be friends with an evil snail. Pretty good leader. Oops. So, he is actually one of my favorite leaders, but not for the reasons that you saw in the clip. Uh, I just think it's funny. So, but what I wanted to do, and most of you have pen and paper in front of you, I wanted to start out by just taking a few moments, not necessarily reflecting on the video, but thinking of who your favorite leader is. Leader can be a political leader, it can be someone who excels in business, someone who is a leader on competitive field of play. Write down who your favorite leader is, if you would, and then write down why. So if you could come up with one or two or three attributes about that leader that makes them your favorite leader, what would those be? And we'll just start with a couple quiet minutes and let you think about that, and then if uh, we'll have some brave volunteers to offer some of that. So whatever you're writing, make sure you can share it with class. Um, and then we'll talk about that. And then we're going to harken back to it at the end. Okay, Jennifer's going to kick us off with her favorite leader and one or two or three reasons why. So, Okay. Uh, the person that came to mind for me was a teacher in my children's school system. His name, we'll just call him Mr. Z, because actually I can't pronounce his last name, and that's what we call him anyway. Uh, the reason why I think he's an amazing leader is because he's very uh, selfless. He goes above and beyond to inspire the kids. I mean, we all know that school teachers don't get rich doing what they do, but he does extracurricular things on the weekends. Uh, he sings gospel music. I mean, he does a lot of a lot of extra things that show that he truly cares. Thank you very much. So I'm going to put caring there too. Who would like to go next? Anyone? Back? Uh, I'll show the. Draymond Green is a former Michigan State Spartan basketball player. Um, I chose him because uh, while he was there his last year, um, he, was a, he was an effective communicator. Um, he had a lot of poise, experience, and uh, he was always able to like lead his team by example. Great. Anyone else? Uh, I, I, uh, I got like 30, but I'd start with Trump, Donald Trump, and Glenn Ashton, I like about some Donald Trump, and, and despite what he might say, uh, he, he, he's got a talent for higher than hell. Okay. Is that it? Multitasker, is that what we said? The last one was uh, Jim Kramer. Uh, CNBC. He's, a, he's a stock guy, entrepreneur. But I like Jim Kramer. 
Kramer because when you, when you talk about stocks and investments, he, he does it for, he has a charitable trust, but he also, he does it for the little guy, the small investor, and he's very knowledgeable about different companies and different sectors, market growth. He has this, this span of knowledge in terms of economics and where this country is going. So I captured knowledge. I kind of, in a word, said empathy when you said he looks out for the little guy. Is that fair? Empathy? Okay, anyone else? Uh, I have JFK on mine, actually. And uh, you've captured everything that I wrote except uh, charisma. And I think that's really important for leaders. Anyone else want to volunteer? Okay. Pretty good list. So if you look at these attributes, they don't exactly describe my favorite leader that I just showed you before. But in seriousness, I want to talk a little bit about some of my famous leaders. So I thought I might be the only one that um, brings up an athlete. But some of my favorite leaders are athletes. And I think it's because um, to the layperson, like I consider myself, you can see whether or not, just by looking at the track record, you mentioned successful, whether they're good or bad leaders. So. When I was, and I'm going to show my age here a little bit, I, um, someone mentioned a, a basketball player. My uh, feeling is the golden era of the NBA was the 1980s. I don't know how many of you were alive to enjoy the 1980s, but um, that's when I thought basketball was at its prime. So a lot of my heroes are uh, NBA players from that era. Michael Jordan, Isaiah Thomas, Larry Bird, and Magic Johnson. All those names sound familiar? Anyone not recognize any of those? Jennifer? Okay, so I'm not that old, unless you've been reading about history. So very famous leaders, very successful leaders. I would say most of them are charismatic, consistent. If you look at their success as one indicator, who knows how many championship rings Michael Jordan won? Six? I think you're correct. What about Isaiah Thomas, our own? We have a two. Larry Bird? 13. Celtics won 13. Larry Bird, while well, he was there, won three. Magic Johnson? Anyone? Anyone got a guess? Five. Very good. So you can see the success that these leaders, they were all the you know, de facto, if not the actual stated leader of their teams, and they led their teams to six, two, three, five, between them 16 championships as players. All of them went on to become either a coach or in the management of the team or a different team that they played for. As a coach or a manager, how many championship rings does Michael Jordan have? Isaiah Thomas, Larry Bird, by now you can guess, right? And Magic Johnson. What changed from here to here? All very successful players. They all led their team. They are all, these are some of the best names in the history of basketball, certainly Michael Jordan. But when they got into a position where they had to lead and manage others, no success to show for it. So this is what I'm talking about, how leadership evolves. There's a, um, a lot of books written on the subject um, of how an entrepreneur goes from being the best tactician in the business to then going on to lead a company. Because I'll use myself as, as an example. When I started a business back in 1999, all I needed to do was be the best PR practitioner than any of my competitors. And so that's what I strove to do. I acquired all the skills. I studied. I out-hustled the competition. At least I tried to. And that's how I was measuring my own success. And that's how my clients were measuring my success. Was I the best PR practitioner, the best tactician, the best player? As that company that I started evolved, I had to evolve with it and had to evolve into a leadership role where I was doing less and less of the tactic work, tactical work and doing more and more of managing a team. Totally different skill set, totally
totally different personality, totally different day-to-day -day activities than when I was trying to be the best practitioner in the business. That's how most entrepreneurs evolve into leadership roles, is they come out of an existing company or they come out of college with a great idea, with a great work ethic, and they're determined to be the best in their business. And they often are if they're successful entrepreneurs. And if they're successful entrepreneurs, that company grows. Right? It can either grow to become a 30-person PR firm, or it can grow to become Apple. And eventually that tactician is no longer, it's no longer enough to be the best tactician. You must build a team. So someone said, I think it was about Donald Trump, he has a talent for hiring the best talent around him, surrounding himself with great talent. But it's not just enough to go out and recruit and retain that talent. It's how are you going to nurture it, grow it, manage it, and ultimately lead it so that your company is as successful as you were as the tactician. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how leadership evolves. Again, I'm going to use my own personal experience first, and then we'll look to the real world for some other examples. Any questions? By the way, I'll stop every once in a while, questions or comments. So this is sort of my history. Um, starting in 1998, I formed uh, with two partners a company called Identity. We were a marketing and public relations firm. And we like to refer to it back then as three guys in a modem, because we literally did our internet was a modem where you plugged the phone line into the wall. Is this ringing a bell to anyone? No? Uh, and we shared it. So when it was my turn to check email, I would go grab the thing, plug it into my computer, and away I had email. We had really no employees. It was a partnership. It was the three guys, the three of us. And it was a lot of fun, to be honest with you. Every Friday afternoon, in the summer at least, we would leave at noon, and we'd play around a golf in the afternoon. This is really before the days where cell phones were ubiquitous, so people could get you at any time with a text or an email or a phone call. So we were able just to kind of leave it and go. Had a lot of fun. The company grew and grew and grew almost to the point where we couldn't control the growth, which is a, most people would say is a good problem to have. But we evolved as a company. And here's where I was trying to be the best PR tactician I could be. And then eventually we, the growth, we had to great, get great talent around us. Well, that great talent needed to be managed. There needed to be some accountability put into place. And eventually, in 2006, I was named the president of the company. So as a president of the company at the time of 18 people, how much of my time do you think was spent actually being a PR tactician? Out of 50 hours a week, how many hours would you guess? Zero. So I was either going to succeed or fail, not based on my skills as a PR professional, similar to Michael Jordan later on in his years, was not being measured by his success dunking the basketball or shooting threes. It was how could he manage a team? How could he lead a team? How could he build the team so that the organization is a success? What was at one time very fun became very complex. So only eight years we went from having the times of our lives to looking around at, at the three of us who started the company and either wanting to strangle each other or strangling someone because it was so complex. By 2012, a leadership team of three, myself being president and the two partners who were COO and CEO, now we had 30 people. And 30 people was a lot different than managing 18 people. So we needed to build a leadership team underneath us so that they could manage the day-to-day -day PR tacticians and we could focus more on the vision of the company, overall growth, and strategy. So we had 25 plus employees, it went between 28 and 30. And so what reared itself as a complexity in the second column became real challenges. A lot more complexity, more, a lot more challenge, and a lot less of this. So here we are now in 2012, in May of this year, I left Identity, partially because I wanted to have a little more fun again, but partially because I wanted to start over, wipe the slate clean, and go back to my roots, which was starting an entrepreneurship. So I left the company I had been with for practically 14 years, 
the standard Elevate Communications. It's LV8. Now, that company has two employees. So the entire company's here today. And we're starting over. By the way, is that anyone tweeting? Hashtag, and if you want to follow me later, that's who I am. So, what I realized as uh, the complexity mounted and the challenges became more and more um, pressing and with greater and greater consequences, we went out and we hired a business coach because we knew at this point we didn't know what we didn't know. None of us went to business school. I studied English. Uh, none of us had an MBA. So we weren't prepared for what was going to face us. But what we learned from hiring a series of business coaches was that what we were experiencing was very common. And there's a whole school of thought around, and I don't know if you've already learned this, but the stages that companies go through. So early on from stage zero is when you're an entrepreneur. It's basically you have an idea. You have an itch. You want to go out on your own. You want to start a company. You're going to succeed or fail on your own merits. You're in stage zero. Once you finally take that first step and become the company, and you file the papers with the state, and you get your tax ID number, now you've got a real company, but it's still just you, maybe a partner, maybe two, three employees, a handful of employees, and you're in the startup phase. That can be a very exciting time. By the time you get to stage two, you're a small business. And so then what became, um, or what started out as a whole lot of energy channeled, and it didn't matter which direction that day because it was just you. And if you wanted to zig, it was just you that zigged. Once you become a small business, you have employees who are counting on certain things. They're counting on predictability. They're counting on their own accountability. They want to know from the leadership, how am I succeeding? How am I helping the company? How am I failing? And when the leader zigs, the entire company is not prepared to zig with it. And in stage three, you're becoming a, an enterprise. You're no longer a small business, but the complexity mounts. So obviously, as you're going through these stages, the business is growing, right? Usually it's growing on a fairly linear path. It may look something like this. But the business growth is going in a fairly predictable, generally speaking, path. But the complexity is increasing exponentially. So if this red line and this gold line were in complete alignment, be a lot easier to plan for and a lot easier to, to uh, absorb into an organization. But the complexity is growing exponentially while the company is growing in a linear fashion. So what does this do to leadership? I've kind of told you my own story, but um, if you're interested in an expert in how companies evolve from stage zero to stage one to stage two, and then ultimately stage three, I work with uh, a gentleman by the name of Dave Haviland. The name of his company is Phimation. It's P-H-I-M-A-T-I-O-N. So I want to attribute this next slide to him because he is my business consultant, shared this with me, and it's a fairly simple concept, but it was truly eye-opening. And this is when we kind of got our arms around this little table as a leadership team, we realized that something needed to change because our company was truly evolving exponentially while we were watching it grow linearly. So if you think of that stage one, or even that stage zero company, it will just say hypothetically an individual or a small partnership team has maybe five core functions that they need to worry about. Five things, big things that they need to do in a given day, a given week, a given quarter, a given year. Five things, right? And they know they need to sell business, so they need to go out and get customers and acquire clients. They probably need to um, actually work on the business or make the widget that they're selling. They need to bill for it, right? There's these five core functions. So as you're the, the in stage zero, you're the entrepreneur or a small partnership sitting in that triangle, it's pretty easy to manage five things. And then once you move on to stage two, it's when you start hiring teams, or you hiring people, rather, to form teams. And so that group that was down here having all the fun, 
moves up here, and now maybe let's say they've hired three people or they've established three business units. In each one of those individuals or each one of those units, they each all have their own five big things that they're accountable for, five major tasks, five major metrics that they're being measured on. And so the person that evolves up into this seat here still has their five things. They might be different five things. So now it might be strategy, vision, business growth, hiring talent, whatever it might be. But they're also accountable for the teams below them who each have their five things. So you went from a position where you had five major things to worry about to now you have 20. Because it's, you're still accountable for whether or not Sally or Joseph does their job in their little triangle. As you evolve from stage two, you can see where this is going, into stage three, you've elevated to the top and now you can see how complex your role as a leader has become, right? Because you might have a leadership team below you you're sitting up above, you're just now doing strategy work. You're only accountable for the ultimate growth, the vision, the direction of the company. And you've got a leadership team underneath you that is in charge of maybe sales, operations, and finance. They're big five things in each of those. And they have teams below them. Ultimately, you're accountable for all of it. So you can see how the complexity grows exponentially as a company grows in a linear way. So what changes, right? What changes when Michael Jordan, Isaiah Thomas, et cetera, move from here to here? Anyone got an, any ideas on why in column, on the left-hand column, we had 16 championships. On the right-hand column, we had zero. Complexity is one answer. Anyone know enough about those players? to maybe hazard a guess of why they weren't successful in the leadership or management role? Because um, when they actually played, if the team was in trouble, they just took over. And they, they led by example. But when they're not actually on the court, they can't do much. I, I'd just like to add to that. <clears throat> Magic Johnson seems to be pretty successful as a business uh, entrepreneur. So something he's doing is right. He has a So as part of the evolution, it doesn't mean that once you failed at leading, you're never going to be a good leader again. So you've heard the expression, he's a born leader or she's a born leader. My experience in the research that I've done says there's no such thing as a born leader. There might be someone who is naturally inclined to be a leader because they either have the inclination of it or the inclination to do it. They have the skill set to do it or they acquire the skill set to do it. They might have certain qualities like charisma that allow them to be in a leadership role. But generally speaking, leaders are not born, they're made. They're either self-made or they go through training to make themselves into better leaders. So is it possible, I don't know enough about Magic Jordan's rest of the story after his coaching days, but is it possible that he was smart enough to go out and hire a consultant to help him be a better leader? or? grab a leadership team, either through recruiting and building a leadership team that could help him lead while he stays up in his visionary role. We'll get back to that in a second. But the answer that you provided is exactly right. In stage one, a great leader excels by being the best. When you are the entrepreneur, if you are the best widget maker, if you are the best PR person, the best insurance salesman, the best engineer of a small startup engineering company, you will be the best and you will lead by example and you will have the ability to get on the playing field and write what's wrong, to excel just by doing, just by being. In stage two, it's not the, the leader that drives the company, it's the vision that drives the company. So I mentioned the zigging, okay? So as you start out it, and I have personal experience with this, where uh, I've noticed that a lot of great leaders, for whatever reason, and this isn't a bad thing, have ADD. I'll put it in quotes, because I don't mean they actually have clinical ADD, 
But part of what makes them great, and part of what led them to be an entrepreneur in the first place, is they got bored and they wanted to try something new. So they were either in a position with a company and they said, I could do this better, and they leave. Or they think, if only there was a company that did what we do but did it slightly different. Some of that boredom can be channeled into action. And so it's very common for the leader of large companies, small companies, to have that boredom and to want to channel their energy into relieving that boredom. So they want to diversify. They want to start a new product. Steve Jobs is a perfect example, right? So when the iPhone came out, the first question, believe it or not, that people ask is, what, do they, what does Apple know about a phone, right? They don't know the first thing about phones. But obviously, they changed the way we think about phones. When they invented the tablet, a lot of us asked, I have a phone that does everything, and I have a computer that does everything. What do I need something in between for? Yet they sold hundreds of millions of tablets, and now all of their competitors followed suit and are creating a better tablet, right? So it's very common to zig and to zag and to say, you know what? I'm, today, scrap everything you're doing. We're going over here. As a small company, and in stage one, that's, a, that's an attribute, and that's what makes you successful. In your, when you're in stage two, 15, 20 employees, whatever it might be, if you ever have a boss that comes into your office and says, I'll ask Laura, and, say, and you're working hard, you've been working three weeks on a project, and the boss comes in, 4 o'clock, says, Laura, stop what you're doing. I want you to stop everything that you're doing and focus on this new project. What do you feel like? A little frustrated. A little underappreciated for all the 50 hours that you spent on the, pro the other project you're working on. And so that can be very disruptive to an organization. So if the type of leader never gets a solid vision, what, I don't know if I was speaking from experience. I was just <laughs> completely hypothetical. Completely hypothetical. What enables a leader in that situation to be successful is to create a vision that is singular in purpose, that is publicly stated to the organization, that he can get the entire or she can get the entire organization to buy into and understand that's what's driving the firm. That insulates the company from the zigging and the zagging in the ADD because now you're allowing the vision to drive the organization and not, you're not at the leader's whims. So when the leader comes in and says, Laura, I want you to drop everything you're doing, if we have a solid vision in place, Laura should be empowered to say, pick a name out of my, the hat, Dave, Dave, that's not what our vision is, right? We spent the last quarter talking about how the vision for the company is to do X, Y, Z, and now you're distracted, and I understand you want to try something new, but what you're suggesting is the exact opposite of X, Y, and Z. We're in this business because of X, Y, and Z. And that allows the tacticians who are looking up to the leader and ultimately want to be leaders themselves, it gives them something predictable, it gives them something understandable and something to all strive towards. And the zigging and the zagging can be somewhat insulated. In stage one, going back to the entrepreneur phase, leaders focus on the work. So if you know any entrepreneurs, if you had a parent or a brother, sister, friend, whatever, that was an entrepreneur, you've probably heard them say that they're not unaccustomed to working 80-hour weeks. And they do it for the love of what they're building and they do it for the ultimate payoff. And they focus all their energies on the work. As you evolve and you become a leader of a stage two company, if you're focusing only on your work and spending no time with your people, the people suffer, the company suffers, and ultimately the leader suffers. So back to the Michael Jordan, I call it the Michael Jordan paradox, because I've worked in organizations where what naturally happens is um, the best tactician gets rewarded for being the best tactician. So the best salesperson ultimately becomes the sales manager. Or the best um, account manager becomes manager of accounts. And you're only rewarding someone because they're doing a great job and you want to keep them. You don't want to lose that person. But what a lot of companies don't focus on is understanding if that great tactician is also going to be a great leader. Can that great basketball player also be a coach? What's very common is the best basketball players, the best tacticians, make the worst coaches. Why is that? Because for them, it was very easy, right? 
They may have worked very hard and they may have struggled, worked out, whatever. But when they were on the playing field, they were dominating. Michael Jordan's a perfect example, LeBron James today. They make it look easy, right? They can dunk from the free throw line. They can shoot triples, you know, turn around with a guy in their face. And they make it look easy and they succeed. And sometimes they win games just on their ability to do that. Once they get up to the position where they're coaching, they see they're coaching a bunch of people who can't do that stuff. And so it becomes very frustrating for that leader to say, well, just make your threes or drive to the lane and dunk. Because for them, that's how they made their success. So in the business world, it's very common for the same thing. You put the best salesperson in a management position, and now they're not accountable for selling. They're accountable for managing a team. And there are frustrations when they're dealing with other people who do not have the same skills that they did. Those skills may have been born into that original person who got successful and promoted, or they may have been nurtured. They may have been developed. Stage one, you don't do that nurturing and developing in a um, programmatic way. It either just happens or it doesn't, and the cream rises. But with that bigger pyramid, now you have all those accountabilities where the people underneath you need to excel the same way you did. And if they don't have the skill set to sell the way that rock star did, then that talent needs to be managed, nurtured, grown. Great tacticians often struggle with that. Great managers aren't necessarily the best tacticians. Great managers have the ability to focus on people. So if we look at the attributes of a great leader, Someone mentioned, and I wrote it down as empathy. It's very possible someone like a Michael Jordan does not have empathy for the person that can't do what they can do. Very common for great tacticians to lack empathy. It's very common for great tacticians to be inconsistent. Because part of their success was that zigging and that zagging that got the company to where it is today. So they don't understand the need for consistency in managing people. But people who are learning and want to be managed need consistency. They need predictability. They need reliability so that ultimately they know what their accountability is. Integrity, poise, charisma. So all of these things that make a great leader are not the same things that make a great tactician. So if you are in a position where you're evolving from the best tactician and you, face it, you are someday facing an opportunity to become the manager, what we need to consider is two things, or a few things. Obviously, the promotion is going to feel good. Obviously, the pay increase is going to look good. But we have to be honest with ourselves. Is it our passion, our joy, and what motivates us to have empathy to deal with people, to manage people, their faults, their failures, as well as their successes? If that is truly you, you will be a great leader and a great manager. If it's not, you will have zero championships, no matter how many championships you had as a player. In stage one, it's very common and very appropriate for a leader to focus on his or her strengths or the organization's strengths. Because it's those strengths that are going to propel a startup company to becoming a real player in a market. In stage two, great leaders are able to focus on weaknesses. So people call these blind spots. A leader who can't recognize his or her own blind spots is failing the organization. Because the rest of the organization can see it. The rest of the organization can say, Dave or Jim or whatever name I use, that person's disruptive to our company. One of his blind spots is he can't see that when he zigs, the entire company throws up their pens and their papers and their laptops. It says, I hate it here. I hate working here. I don't know what he wants, right? But in stage two, you need to focus on your weaknesses because as that complexity mounts, the weaknesses are going to be a little more hidden because you're conditioned to focusing on strengths. So the team members who aren't playing together nicely at the lower levels that leader needs to recognize that and want to address it as a weakness and fix it. Not always just replace the parts. 
because if the system is broken and you start firing people and you bring in new people and inject broken parts or good parts into a broken system, it's still broken. So the evolution is from focusing on strengths to focusing on weaknesses. So we asked the question at the beginning, what are the qualities of great leadership? Looking at this list, is there anything we would add to it or anything that we would kill from this list knowing that as a company evolves, a leader must evolve with it or build a leadership team around them that can evolve with the company? Is there anything we want to highlight, kill, amplify? Can I call on some of the people that already answered? So Donald Trump, right? So obviously he's evolved as a leader. Any of these characteristics or any others do you think you would focus on and say that that's really why he's a leader? What about this one, the hiring talent? Anyone else want to take a stab? Uh, I, I would say knowledge. Anyone else? Inspiring. Inspiring. Pardon me? Politician. Being able to be a politician, so diplomacy or? Um, yeah, the, I think the, the leader has to have the ability to go out and influence the people that he wants. The company's values, vision, and sell it. Okay. So I'll put that in quotes and sell it now that we know what it, or in circle it now that we know what it means. What's interesting about when you ask people for their, great, their favorite leaders and what makes them a leader, most of the times the things that you write on a board are soft skills. They're things like empathy, caring, selfless, inspiring, charisma, poise. So it's interesting that that's where this group went to. Because as you evolve, so follow with me kind of what we talked about today, this evolution of a tactician into a leader, it's totally different skills, right? Totally different person that's going to make a great leader. Not necessarily different actual people person, but a different type of person. So that person can either grow into it, they can be taught into it, or they can grow out of it. But the skills that they're going to need to acquire have nothing to do with the tactician part of their business. Nothing to do with being the best engineer, the best widget maker, the best PR person, the best insurance salesman. If you are someday aspiring to be a leader, the stuff that we've written on the board here is the stuff that will carry you into leadership. Ultimately, leaders become team players again. So as they evolve into a leadership role, and the company evolves, they're going to find themselves working with other leaders. So a perfect example is a company that has a vice president of sales, VP of operations, VP of marketing, VP of HR. Eventually, that whole team needs to come together. And the team is either functional or dysfunctional. And it's all based on soft skills. I've taken this from a book called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. See if you uh, write that down. Try to remember it from a day sometime in the future where you are in a leadership role and you're working with a team of other leaders, department heads, whatever it might be, managers. And there's going to come a day where you look around and you say, this team can't work together. And I do my job great, Joe does his job great, Sally does his job great, but when we come together as a team, we fail. 
very common in organizations because they don't put the hard work into building a team of leaders. And the author of this book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, um, his name is Patrick Lencioni, and he tells a parable which is very, uh, it's kind of fun to follow, but it's very uh, elucidating. And he has what he calls the pillar of trust, which is what this is, the pyramid of trust, I'm sorry. Because what he contends and what he demonstrates in the book is that the root of successful leadership teams is either an absence or a presence of trust. So what does he mean? So when that group comes together, a lot of times they are either so busy or they don't care enough to trust the, the group that they're working with and managing with, or they start assigning motives to other people's actions. So Joe shows up late for the meeting. He didn't care about this meeting. He's not a team player. Well, it could have been that Joe was on the phone with the biggest client trying to repair a relationship that had gone back bad from one of his team members. But there's all sorts of this absence of trust in leadership teams. And so if there's an absence of trust, and there isn't real trust in the group, as they come together to solve the organization's problems, that bears itself out as a fear of conflict. So they're sitting in a board meeting, and they're trying to solve one of the biggest problems in the company. And they all kind of have their own agendas, and they all have their own ideas. But they don't trust their team members, so they hold back and they don't contribute to the meeting. Ultimately, they're not contributing to the success of the organization. So they have what, so, so how this manifests is artificial harmony. So you, hear, you know the term yes men. So a lot of people are nodding their heads, yeah. Deep down they're thinking this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. I just want to get out of this meeting. I got to go back to my client. Um, and they think that by having this artificial harmony, they're actually keeping the group together as leaders, as a leadership team. And so let's say they bring up a problem. Here's problem A. How do we want to fix it? Someone says, I think we should do solution Z. Everyone, yeah, that's fine. Deep down, they don't believe it, though. Solution Z is the stupidest idea they ever heard of. What they really want to do is solution X. But they're afraid to bring it up because they're afraid that they don't, you know, they don't have the trust with their team. So they're afraid to either get laughed at or dismissed or whatever or that no one will buy into it. So they just keep it to themselves. And they walk out of that room with a lack of commitment to what was decided in the room. They said they would do it, but they don't really believe it. And so there's all sorts of ambiguity as you walk out of that room, even though it's not manifest as amb ambiguity, excuse me, ambiguity, as to who's doing what. Because they may have taken notes and they may have said, all right, as a le leadership team, this is what you're doing, this is what you're doing, this is what you're doing. Let's go out into the, our day-to-day -day lives and solve this problem as a leadership team but there's no buy-in. So if you haven't bought in to the solution that the leadership team has come to, there's an avoidance of accountability. Because I didn't really think this was a solution to begin with. So when it fails, that's when I say, hey, this was Jim's idea. I mean, he was the one that brought it up. And you know, I didn't say so at the time, but I thought it was a horrible idea. So there's no accountability because no one wants to take accountability because no one, they didn't assign true accountability based on a commitment in the room for all of us to go out together with a unified front. And ultimately there's an inattention to results. So obviously if solution Z was agreed to in the room but solution X is what two out of the three people wanted to actually explore and there were no results, then we say, well, hey, we tried. I mean, we all came together. We decided as a group we were going to do this, and it didn't work. And so then people start fighting for their own status and their own ego. And Jim might raise his hand and say, well, I'll tell you right now, sales isn't the problem. We're outperforming over last year 20%. And then the VP of HR raises her hand and says, well, I'll tell you right now, I mean, I've been recruiting my behind off, and I'll tell you, we have better talent today than we did last, last year or last quarter. And so everyone starts fighting for their own little status and their own ego based on the fact that they were inattention to results. And all, that only fosters the absence of trust. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Are you in a group of friends that you have this, you're afraid to say? Or in a family member where you're afraid to tell dad he's wrong? Have you ever been in a, a group setting? So very common. 
So the takeaways that I want to look at, I'll open it to questions. We're about almost at the end of our time here. There are a few things. One is to understand that the best tactician does not make necessarily the best leader. Two totally different skill sets. Tacticians are measured by hard skills, success or fail. Leaders are measured on soft skills, success or fail. You can't learn caring, empathy, knowledge, charisma at any school that I've ever been to. Maybe finishing school. Maybe my pet, my dog learned some of those things. Dog school, dog training. The other thing is, as you evolve as a tactician, you evolve as a person. You are either going to evolve in or out of a leadership position, either by default or because you've actually gone out and pursued it. And you need to understand, are these the things I care about? Or would I rather be sitting behind a desk, making my widget, and being the best tactician? Because any company that you are in, whether it's a startup or it's already an established enterprise, will be evolving. There's always evolution. Again, my favorite example is Apple. It started out as a computer company. It used to be called Apple Computers. I have an Apple computer, but they're not known for their computers. Great computers, but they're known for iTunes, iPad, iPhone. So the company will evolve. Your role within it will evolve. The leadership challenges will evolve. The question is, does the leadership team have the ability to evolve? And if you're in that leadership team, do you have the ability to evolve with it? And the last thing I wanted to bring up was if you are blessed, and I do think it is a blessing to be a great leader um, because you have all these wonderful qualities, you will be in a position where you will still need to be accountable to a team of other leaders. So I mentioned that you know, the previous slide was that the five dysfunctions of a team in the trust pyramid. Go back to that. Again, someday, buy the book, read it online, whatever you need to do, and be honest with yourself and be honest with that leadership team where the, where the dysfunctions truly are. It's almost always rooted in an absence of trust. Again, a soft skill. and The leader at the top ne either needs to foster trust or that lack of trust is going to tear the leadership team apart and ultimately the organization. So if you have any interest in checking out this presentation, you wanted to share it with someone, just go to this link. It's bit.ly slash leadership LTU. Um, if you want to connect on Twitter, I'm tnixon16. And I will open it up and see if there are any questions anyone has or comments or feedback. I'd love to hear it. This, what I'm talking about here, I'm describing a leadership team. So they're all leaders of their own divisions, and they're coming together weekly, monthly, quarterly to solve a company's problems or solve an organization's problems, and they need to work together as a team, right? But a lot of times, this absence of trust comes from an invulnerability. So in that, it, it, the reason that shows up is a couple of different reasons. One is I described um, the assigning of motives to somebody else's actions, okay? So for example, I mentioned the, the person who walked in late to the meeting, that was Jim. Jim walks in late to the meeting. The rest of the leadership team look at him like, nice of you to join us, right? But really, so they're assigning a motive that that person didn't care enough about this meeting to be here, or that they're just a slacker or whatever. But Jim's real motive may have been he was on the phone with the company's biggest client. They're about to lose him, and he needed to put out a fire. He comes in with the idea that <clears throat> my leadership team trusts me, and if I'm five minutes late for a meeting, they'll cut me some slack. But there's not, so that person has, um, open themselves up to a vulnerability. But the rest of the team doesn't truly trust him. Okay? So, is it easy enough to see how that can manifest itself in an organization, this lack of trust? Like you're so, like you need a culture of trust that will promote. Right. And so, usually what it is, it's promoting vulnerability. It's the old, you know, there's no such thing as a bad answer. No one really believes that. If, if anyone says, you know, Raise your hand if you think um, we should go down Avenue A. There's no such thing as a bad answer. And that one's just kind of like, because they do think there's such thing as a bad answer. They're afraid of either being wrong, disagreeing with the owner of the company, or what the person sitting next to me is going to think of me if I say this. So, because they're not vulnerable, there's no trust within the room. 
So a team that has a lot of high degree of vulnerability fosters a high degree of trust. And so then what I, the point I was making from that and the point that Pat Lencioni makes, if there's no trust, there's a fear of conflict. So in that meeting, no one will raise their hand and say, Joe, president of this company, you're being a jerk. This is wrong. This is stupid. Because they're afraid of what the president of the company is going to think of them, so they're not vulnerable. So they don't, so there's this artificial harmony in the room. So people say, okay, you know, the owner of the company stands up and says, I think we should completely change course and um, instead of making tennis balls, we're going to go into the buggy whip industry. Does any, anyone disagree with that? And then we'll just kind of, as soon as they leave the room, they say, what is he thinking? This is the stupidest idea, right? So there's no conflict in the room. There's a lack of commitment to actually follow that leader into the fire to stop making tennis balls and start making buggy whips. They said they would do it. Everyone said, yeah, 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 good, good, yeah, okay. But there's really no commitment. And the, re the reason there's no commitment is because they were afraid to say, I disagree. The reason they were afraid to say, I disagree, is because they didn't trust the leader that if they said, I disagree, they wouldn't be fired or mocked or whatever. Right? So if they haven't truly committed to the outcome that they described in that meeting to solve a problem for the organization, there's no true accountability. There's just low standards. Because it wasn't really my idea to begin with. So when we start failing, which is the inattention to results, it's easy for the rest of the team to start pointing fingers at other people and say, well, this is his idea. I mean, he was the one that wanted to do it, and right? So it all comes back to establishing trust at the leadership team and promoting vulnerability. Truly have to believe that you can say anything in a meeting. And I actually uh, had a client once who, when they went into their quarterly leadership meetings, they got the entire group to truly, honestly, buy into the fact that we are forgetting our titles. So the chairman of the company, you're not chairman of the company, you're just Mike. And the president of the company, you're not the boss of Judy, you're just John, right? So what that did, it had incredibly, uh, there was a ton of conflict in these meetings, but it was healthy conflict. And they would argue and they would knock down on each other. And so, but those, everyone in that room felt like, you know what, hey, I said my piece. I truly, honestly, I had no fear of conflict, and I was able to say, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Ultimately, that group needs to resolve the conflict and decide as a group that when we walk out the room, because I heard you say this is the stupidest idea, I need you to buy into it because you're being overruled. Do you truly buy into it? That person generally will buy into it because at least I said, and I, the whole room heard me, and no one laughed at me, and no one yelled at me when I said this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard, and you know what, if this is what the company needs to do, I'm behind it. You generally have that type of dynamic if you allow everyone to truly express themselves, if you, they have the trust that they're not going to be mocked, ridiculed, fired, whatever, ostracized. And so this group, they would fight, they would knock down drag, and then eventually they'd come to a resolution, they'd write it on the board, and they'd say, this is what we're doing. Yeah, I know not everyone is 100% behind it, but can you get behind it so that we walk out this room and we all go to our teams to explain what we're doing as a company, you will honestly believe that this is the right way to go? They say yes, they walk out in harmony, and the company was, they had an extremely healthy dynamic. A lot of times we measure, you know, a lot of times people would come into that group and say, they are dysfunctional. Look at the way they fight, and they call each other names, and so-and-so got up and was all animated. They were just totally dysfunctional. That is the most functional leadership team you could have.